This is a story you can believe in. A true life tale of two men and a remarkable woman. It's also a story about true life. Gritty, down to earth, often wrenching, ultimately hopeful, always surprising. It's a tale of a man who grew up in virtual slavery, picking cotton for the man as late as the 1960s. A man who never attended a day of school, never was paid for his years of back-breaking labor, who saw surviving on the street as a step up in life. He certainly never dreamed he'd be friends with an SUV-driving, Starbucks-sipping white man. His name was Denver Moore, and this is his story told in his voice. An upscale art broker with an eye for a masterpiece and a nose for a deal, he'd shot like a rocket from selling soup to selling Picassos. At home in Hollywood haciendas, Soho galleries, and European castles, he'd never expect the next chapter of his life would be written in an inner city homeless shelter, or that a street person's fierce loyalty and uncanny spiritual insight would carry him through the most painful time of his life. Meet Ron Hall. This is his story too, told in his voice as well. Of course, this is first and foremost Debbie Hall's story, a gutsy woman of deep conviction. It was her compassion and persistence that brought them together, her vision that transformed an inner city and eventually brought hope to thousands. The same kind of difference me is about a dangerous, homeless drifter who grew up picking cotton in virtual slavery, an upscale art dealer, a customer of the world of Armani and Chanel, a gutsy woman with a stubborn dream, a story so incredible, no novelist would dare dream it. Same kind of different as me has a powerful message that speaks to us and inspires us to get up and act. That's why we're all here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Hall. We hear sometimes 100 emails a day from people that have read our book telling us things that they have done as a result of reading our book and, and, and helping one act of kindness that they did for a homeless person. But months ago, we get a letter from a woman in Seattle, Washington, who said that after reading our book, she wanted to do something nice. She wanted to for a homeless person, and so she told her eight-year-old son, she said, the next homeless person we see, we're gonna do something for them. And lo and behold, by luck or coincidence, which I love to say luck or coincidence, because a friend told me years ago that, you know, a coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And by coincidence, the next day, as she drove in her driveway, there were two homeless men in the alley digging through a dumpster. And her little eight-year-old son said, Mommy, let's give them the chicken dinner we just bought at the grocery store. And so they did, and they spread a picnic out there on the alley, and the two men began eating it. And the woman and her son went inside, and to her, that was kind of the end of the story. But she said, I'm not a believer, I'm not a religious person. So, but she said, I had the strong impression that I needed to go in my purse and see if there was any money left. And so I did, and there were two $20 bills sitting in there. So I went back to the alley, and I gave each man a $20 bill. And to her, that was the end of the story. You know, she had blessed someone. You know, there is a difference between blessing and helping someone. A blessing is a one-time kind of thing, and a help is something you stick with. But anyway, to her, it was the end of the story. Months later, some man knocks on her door, a very nice-looking man, and he said, do you remember me? And she said, I sure do not. And he said, I'm one of those two men you gave $20 and a chicken dinner to months ago, and I came back to thank you and let you know how that changed my life. And he said, do you know what I did with the $20? And she said, no, I don't. He said, well, I took it to a bar and I got drunk. Well, you know, that's exactly what we would expect him to do. And that's why we don't want to give them any money. But you know, Denver busted me on that years ago when we were on the streets of Fort Worth. He told me one day, we, he and I were walking the streets, and I'd like to pass out a few dollars, bless people here and there. And um, one day I got to one man who looked like he was so drunk he couldn't stand up, and, and all I had in my pocket was a $20 bill. And I said, Denver, I'm not going to give that man a 20 because he's going to get drunker. And he said, well, Mr. Ron, let me ask you something. Have you ever gone with a $20 bill in your pocket and gone and bought you a six-pack? 
I said, okay, let's not stop this, just stop this judgmental attitude of yours. Uh, yes, I have done that. He said, then don't, he said, don't judge the man, just bless him. And so I did. I gave the man a 20, and we walked on down the street. And Denver turned me around and looked at me right in the eye. And he said, now I want to tell you something, Mr. Ron. He said, the man you gave the 22, his name is Jose, and he doesn't drink. He said, that man was one of the hardest working men. He lived on the streets and lived in the mission because he was from Mexico and he sent all of his money home. And he made a huge sacrifice to do that. He said, but he had a stroke and he has no insurance or medical. So now he's homeless on the streets with no medical help. And he said, he still doesn't drink. He depends on people like you to get him through the day. And he has no money to even get back to Mexico. And he said, so what I want to tell you, Mr. Ron, is that you judged a man without knowing his heart and knowing who he was. I'll tell you, I made a vow that day that I would try not to do that again. But back to the story here of the lady. He, after he got drunk at the bar, he, that night at the bar he met a woman who told him, you're obviously homeless. We've never seen anybody like you in this bar before. And by the... the the time the night was over, the woman had convinced him that he needed to go home, back to his hometown. And so she took him to the bus station, bought him a one-way ticket back to his hometown. And he said, when I got there, I was received like the prodigal son. I'd been on the streets more than 20 years. My family thought I was dead. So when I walked in the door, they could not believe it. He said, but I experienced the forgiveness. I experienced uh, rehabilitation. I got clean. I got sober. I got a job. And I came back to Seattle to thank you and the lady, other lady that made it possible. He said, but I've been back in Seattle two months now. I'm working. I have a good job. And he said, and I haven't had time to get over here. But what I wanted to tell you today is that the lady that bought me the bus ticket to go home, she and I are now engaged and we're going to be married. And I came to invite you to the wedding. So the $20 that you gave, that I intended to get drunk on, God had a different plan for that 20. Mm. To introduce to you, the philanthropist of the year, the hottest selling artist, the New York Times best selling author. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you my best to Atlanta, Mr. Denver Moore, who is the man of Debbie's dreams. Denver, come up, shut him down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ron, and the host of the, this event, and I thank all of you who participated to come here today to help Atlanta be a better place for those who are in need. Because we must understand that the only thing that we keep forever is the things that we give away. And the more you give, the more you get. Because there is many people out there that is confused a throw it off, a jump track. Broken promises shatter dream, shatter dream destroys lives. So a lot of times we can't judge the book by its cover. We'll never know whose eyes God is watching you out of. 